Um, so last night I was, uh, you know, thinking about our, our time together the last couple of days and, and thinking about all I have heard, learned from you and, and heard from you and how much I need to take back to my teams. Um, and it's just so hard to, you know, just really digest all of the incredible, you know, things that we've learned and shared together. So um, uh, I was up until about 3 a.m. because of uh, Guy Fox um, uh, celebration. So it's, it's just interesting because, you know, some of what we will be talking about maybe is about, you know, who are we um, on three hours of sleep because of incidents? Who are we as new parents maybe who whose baby's going through like some sleep stuff you know um uh, so and i hope that our conversation today will um spark in you you know these this sparkler this is this is the community sparkling and like but that light you know be the light and share what you're learning so i hope that um you'll understand and forgive me that 45 minutes is is not nearly enough time to talk to you about all the amazing content that I think <clears throat> your teams would really benefit from. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, names and changed have, you know, names and details have been changed to uh, protect the innocent. Um, some of the stories I'll be sharing with you today are an amalgamation of, of people I've worked it with in 20 plus years in IT. Um, so um, a lot of it too is what I'm learning um, from, from all of the community as well. <clears throat> if you were to move and meet a new neighbor and you wanted to tell them about how teams really work well together in your organization, what would, what would you say? Would you, would you take a few seconds now to turn to the person on your left and right and tell your neighbor about how the teams work well in your org? Please, please. <laughs> Come take a picture of this from here. Um. I've got a helper up here to capture this magic moment. I'll carry you on. Now, 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 now. Don't let me stop you. Um. Did you feel that? <laughs> that is something to hold on to because it's going to sustain you through some of the really challenging times we have in IT working on these complex adaptive systems that um, are, have, in many cases, life and death consequences for the people on the en other end of the code. Um, so hold on to that. It's, uh, you, you will need to call on it, and it, and it can sustain you. Um, uh, so let's talk about retrospecting our retrospectives. Um, uh, this time around, I've been at Microsoft about a year and four months, but who's counting? Um, and I 
work on this amazing team called uh, Azure DevOps, and we were fortunate to hear from Anthony Borton, um, who gave the most amazing talk about some of the things that Microsoft has you know, changed. Um, so this talk will be um, about, you know, amalgamation of my learnings, um, things I've observed in various teams and through various conversations, you know, in our open spaces yesterday, we talked about postmortems. And I was like, I don't want to give you this, I don't want to be the, the spoiler and like, I, I was going to wait for this so I can tell you about it in the talk. Um, but I asked myself a bunch of questions at the beginning of this journey, which is about basically the last, last year and three months of mine to find out about our software, find out about this unfamiliar, unfamiliar engineering stack. We were having so many incidents. It felt like, it felt like uh, fragile. It felt like could, could I possibly contribute in any way to this? I don't have a master's degree in human factors yet. Um, but can I share what I'm learning and would, would this team be, be receptive? And would it matter? Like, would it even matter? Like, at the scale we're operating at, you know, it's just like, can, there, can you do anything? Is there reason to hope? And, and I think you saw that there's reason to hope. So. Uh, here we go. We're going to talk about some uh, things around postmortems. I um, flew 20 hours door to door, it's a 12 hour flight to Auckland, from LAX to get here on Saturday. And um, I'm in the future, by the way, so if you're watching this talk on YouTube, like I'm, you know, my colleagues back in Redmond, um, you know, this hasn't happened yet, so I'm like here with you in the future. Um, <laughs> And I feel like that with some of the stuff we've saw, seen from the banking and folks talking about, you know, pipelines, not paperwork. So uh, this air, I spent a lot of time on planes. Anthony, um, you know, has quite a list. I, I do not aspire to his level of travel, but um, it brings up some interesting questions about automation and trust and some other themes that we've heard throughout the conference around what does it mean to be, um, have robust systems? What does it mean to have resilience. Resilience is something a system does. It's not something it has. It's not a property. Um, and so when you get on the plane, there's this tremendous, like, maybe you don't think about it subconsciously or at any kind of level, but basically, like, you are trusting someone else's decision around automation. And you're trusting that to fly over these vast distances with my three beautiful children and husband in tow. Um, and so it raises this trust uh, issue of the dynamics of trust between humans and machines, the calibration of trust, and the problem of allocating responsibility for control uh, between the human and the machine. Um, this is from a paper by Neville Moray, who sadly passed away recently. Um, I feel fortunate that I've been able to read his research. I just, it's so eloquently stated. Um, this clicker doesn't work, that's all right. Uh, the FAA is issuing a rule, um, this is urgent, um, the Boeing 787 Dreamliner. Um, all three computer modules that manage the jet's flight control services could actually stop working during the flight. No big deal. Um, operators must periodically shut and restart the electrical power on the planes or the power to the three flight control modules. That's going to avoid the problem until they have a permanent fix. The point being is that if they did not follow this new procedure, um, it's going to reboot like after 20, every 22 days. Like, you know, rebooting fixes 99% of all these problems. But it's like it's a big plane, you know, it's just like really, we're rebooting. Um, so you're trusting a lot, right? Um, okay. 1975, a lot of cool things happened in 1975. Um, I don't have like a giant list, I'll just talk about a few. Um, you know, one of them is um, Microsoft, was founded in 1975, right? Bill Gates. Um, and um, I was born in 1975. Coincidence? I don't know. Um, how many? 40 plus year old companies do you know that have a mission statement that has held to their original founder's vision? 
1975, our mission was to enable people and business throughout the world to realize their full potential. Today, in 2018, Satya Nadella, it's still 2018, right? Um, Satya Nadella, you know, our, our um, current mission statement has really held true. If anything, it's expanded. It's, we want to empower every person on the planet to achieve more. Um, kind of a testament to the power of vision and, and communicating values and what your purpose is. We've heard that through the conference, too. Uh, these numbers, I think I have a more current number than you, but um, <laughs> we need to be doing DevOps with our presentation decks, Anthony, come on. Um, uh, the scale at Microsoft and the service that we work on is um, mind-boggling. Um, we're super proud of like our latest gift to the open source community that we are excited for people to take advantage of Azure Pipelines, free build minutes uh, for any open source project, Azure Pipelines. Woohoo! Um, okay, let's get into this. So I'm learning about our incidents, I'm learning about our software, but some context might be helpful, right? We've heard that context is key to presentations and communicating effectively. Um, <laughs> If you could see this slide, it's amazing. Um, boom. This is me. I have been on call for like forever. Forever. I mean, I'm like in, in technology years, you know, I'm this many technology years old. That's me rocking the Motorola StarTac page, um, on my left hip right hip, and the Motorola pager. Look at how happy I am. I'm so proud to be, you know, that, like, but when you're starting in IT, this is, a, this is many years ago, clearly by the technology, you can see that. The point is, is that to me at that moment in my career, I felt like this, this is a pretty great responsibility, and, and isn't it a big responsibility to be on call? and to be in these fixing roles and, and helping roles. I was super excited about it. I was like, you know, had them both right there so I could be sure to get to them, you know, when, you know, exchange needed to barf and like things like that. Um, so anyway, so that's the context. Like I've been doing this for a super long time. I've been on call for a really long time. I worked in a pediatric intensive care unit. I was responsible for um, basically communicating to, to critical care physicians via a pager with a screen this big, such key small pieces of information that were so contextual to the patient and like, so that was the space I had to work with to tell the doctor about lab results so that they could make decisions in a timely, timely way. So that's the context is I uh, just have worked in, in high consequence um, domains and you know, now I'm just understanding where we needed to um, go with that in our software. And, and uh, I was just so pleased to learn that human factors and resilience engineering and cognitive systems engineering are not new concepts. There's an entire community of researchers and practitioners who um, are well, would welcome to talk with any of you with open arms because they uh, believe in this so much and they're you know going to Lund University uh, and working on their master's degree to really understand um, what do we do when things go wrong? How do you move on in the face of suffering? This is a community of people who uh, taught me to view incidents as opportunities and as unplanned investments, which I thought was a pretty amazing way to view these things. I heard once about a CEO who, it was like a million dollar outage, a lot of money. And he said, and I don't know the reference, but can you get me a million dollars of learning out of this? 
so that we might all have a manager like that who could see it that way and, and see it about learning. So its incidents are, are providing these opportunities. Um, they, can, they can provide feedback to new training. To We heard about bringing on your junior engineers and having them review your past postmortem documents as a training tool and a like, like living culture. Like, is this really a culture of safety and culture of positive postmortem culture? Um, OK, some more. Uh, the Navy, you know, we, we would think they are, they've been around for a long time. They should probably be really good at these things. I, there was a period of time where there was a tremendous number of, of loss of life. And it was around um, this time where I just thought, and if we look into the article, we see, I wonder if the sleep, um, if the watch were sleep deprived. Um, and then thousands of posts from sailors and vets telling their story about how little sleep they'd gotten during their time in the Navy. Three to four hours of sleep per night, every night. And that years afterwards, long after they'd left the military, they'd have trouble sleeping more than four hours a night, which led to issues with depression. Um, some remembered so tired that they reported the moon as an enemy contact. The moon! Um, okay, that was my inside loud voice. <laughs> um, OK, they were on duty for 108 hours per week. And this kind of like production burnout culture, um, we, see, we see sometimes the tragic, tragic results. And you know, uh, you got to get some, get some sleep. Um, they have made these decisions now, no more you know, 100 hour work weeks. They're going to move to this circadian rhythm thing. There's, there's other issues with these fixes, by the way. But you know, three hours of watch duty and then nine hours off, that's interesting. Um, OK, so again, incidents as opportunities. Um, so what happens then after the incident? Do we, do we get together and like drink a beer to celebrate that we got the site back up? Maybe, but we probably do a postmortem. We probably, or have like a learning review or a after accident debriefing. Like the language is, is like, don't be attached to the language because what someone calls, you know, one thing. You know, it's just like, are you speaking the same language? Do we want to get together and learn from this? Um, and so the thing is, though, they're not magic. And um, if you don't hear anything else I say, I want you to leave feeling empowered that I'm going to give you a place to start unraveling this thread and pulling on it. Because what I hope to do, I, again, can't cover all of this, is I, I want you to want to learn more. And if, if, and if I um, create that desire in you, then um, that's winning, in my, in my view. I want to share this far and wide. Um, they're not magic. They don't make change happen. You can have really amazing postmortems, beautiful templates, and, and like nothing really has changed. And there was still maybe a lot of blame. Again, um, they're just signals about the health of the org. And even when we have positive and ne negative sig signals, we can try to look for the wellness uh, and the health that exists in even the sickest of orgs. Is this the system? Looks like it. Looks good. We've got some, got chat supervisor. Maybe that was written in Rust. We've got message router, web super. We've got some HA proxy in here, maybe web server. Cool. Like, great, back in the action sketch, we're sharing. Cool, beautiful. Oh, here's a good one. Maybe this is the system. Is this the system? We've got GitHub in there. Finally closed that acquisition. <laughs> Made it through the pipeline. Um, uh, we've got beautiful distributed Cosmos DB geo-replicated. Looks beautiful, right? We've got admin access in there in box number eight, too. Nice. Um, really? Is that the system? Really? Where are the people?
when I go to the airport and I'm trying to find my gate, I see a map and it says, you are here. <laughs> those diagrams don't have those. And, and you're nowhere to be found. So what, the system just like drew itself on your whiteboard? <laughs> so Allspa asks us, where are the people? Um, I'm going to get a bumper sticker that says like, what would John Allspaw do? Like, <laughs> WW. Okay. We're blessed to have him sharing his knowledge with the world. Uh, so here, what do we do? What do we talk about? How do we talk about these things? Um, what, what is the whole point? Um, I'm going to talk, that we're talking about some dark stuff that, that you know, is, burns reputations, burns money. Um, the point is that that, I want you to understand this, and this quote I think really conveys it from the Fierce Conversations book, is that our careers and our companies and our personal relationships, um, they succeed or fail gradually, then suddenly, one conversation at a time. Are you saying everything that needs to be said? so that there's nothing unclear with you and the other human in your conversation about you know, your perceptions of the incident. Like, because someday it might be the last conversation you have. And I'll dedicate this uh, time with you to uh, one of my mothers who passed suddenly and was so supportive of my career. So these conversations matter. Um, fierce Conversations, pick up the book. Um, I hope I don't have to talk to you again today, because we have on, been on three bridges together today, and I haven't eaten lunch. <laughs> Should be on the wiki. Did you look on the wiki? We need to not let this happen again. <laughs> Just making sure you see this one. <laughs> that was the hero bridge. And if it weren't, for Judy. It would have been much, much worse. And we know because last year we did not know to call her. We couldn't figure out, you know, and without her it would have been much, much, much worse. Do you ever have incident bridges like that? That you're like, holy shit, what did they do? That was so good. Why was that good? Why did this other one suck? I think the other incident is related. I just, I just have this feeling. Like it feels viscerally in your body because we have this somatic knowledge of expertise from 20 years of banging on the keyboard and we know when things feel wrong because that is expertise. And that is what you should be measuring of how much capacity to respond in those ways that you have, to amplify those experts and what is it that makes them expert and, and make it safe for them to say, I think it's related. Okay, we spent a lot of time uh, below the line, Allspaw uh, All and the Stella Report will, you've probably seen this. Anybody read the Stella Report? Am I the only one? Okay, stop what you're doing. No. Um, Stella.report. Stella. Um, there's a reason it's named Stella. I won't... Uh, I'll, I'll, I won't uh, spoil it for you. Okay, the point is, is that what they discovered in the Stella report, which was studying incidents from companies like Etsy, companies like IBM, you know, other, you know, very large companies, what they discovered is a whole bunch of like really interesting themes emerged from this, from this research. 
And one of the key things that they, they point out, which I'm still trying to understand because it's hard, right? Um, we spend a lot of time below the line. We have entire conferences dedicated to databases and deployment tools, don't we? I've lost track of how many conferences uh, on monitoring. Now they've got observability conferences. Um, and these are all good things. It's all community happening. It's cool. But we spend a lot of time talking about this. We draw a lot of diagrams. And we are missing 92% of the conversation. OK, uh, how am I doing on time? Uh, 15 minutes? 5, 10? Beautiful. I'll be fast. Uh, it'll be good. Um, so we have all of these tools that are ostensibly supposed to give us safety, right? Because this, you know, CI, CD, what are you really doing that for? You're doing it because you want to build software safely and humanely and deploy things in a repeatable way that's, you know, not manual and you're not toil and doing things, um, you know, over and over and over and over and over again. Did you hit the enough keys today? Um, sorry. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. Um, what about this? What about a manually managed spreadsheet? <clears throat> Describing the state of a software system and labeling it as the source of truth. Because that never happens at Microsoft. It, it, it really doesn't, but I do see it happening. So um, this is interesting. So these people are working above the line. We have all the systems below, but we do not have conferences. Well, now we have redeploy conference that talks about what's happening in your head because you don't talk about it for some reason because you like dev and ops and they're in a different team or something. But you have different expertise. We talked about the expertise. But your vision and your mental model, and we've heard time and attend through the conference about mental models. Um, all of this work that you're doing with your expertise to get the stuff ready for the system, that's where the work is happening. Um, and all that separates you is a thin green line that might be a computer screen or a pager display this small that you're communicating and, and reading information back. Um, so why does it matter? What about the clicking and anticipating and inferring and chat logs and things, those clicks and signals and interactions that you have? Um, those are all mental models at work um, expressing how you believe the world to be. Um, so if I haven't made it clear, um, please let Dr. Cook explain it more clearly. The system is also you. And if you're looking for resilience, it's above the line. And the rest of this talk is about above the line. If you want to talk about above, below the line, we could totally jam and do some demos and talk about your pipeline, whatever you want. I'm here for you. OK, um, almost done. Resilience is here. It's above the line. If you go and read the snafu catchers, there's a key piece that illustrates much of what I'm talking about. It's catching the Apache snafu. Um, this is a case where we've been promised this vision that config management is like the way, the truth, and the light, right? This is the path, right? And then we um, don't know how to deploy manually when it, the pipeline doesn't work. But what's interesting here is that this vision of uh, the chef recipe beautifully managing my um, Apache configs, right? Everything's lovely. I'm under config management, so I'm doing it right, okay? Doing the DevOps. In this incident, somehow the chef run got like a, wasn't like a pinned environment version to get the right version of Apache. And basically the chef run happened and it wiped out like eight of the 10 servers that were responsible for keeping that service up. Now, the irony is that the two servers that didn't get the chef run were the only thing keeping the system running, uh, limping along. And so you could buy like knit cozies very slowly on Etsy. Um, so, but the, but the thing is, is again, those servers were out of compliance and misconfigured, weren't they? Ironies of automation. OK. Well-facilitated debriefings help you fix this. They help you with this. They help you recalibrate what's in your brain. Not like we're trying to all sync up like you know, the mind meld or anything like that, but just like accept, accept the, the different mental models that we have. Um, I talk about this because um, organizational culture is um, 
not an easy thing to, to understand what to do and why, what makes it safe to deploy on a Friday versus you better not do that except in this one maintenance window. What is safety? Um, there's lots of pathological or organizations that do this kind of blame-driven development like we heard from one of the speakers. Um, this fear-based culture, especially in highly regulated industries where workers who felt so um, personally like that, that they would be punished if they made a mistake if they got it wrong with these audits um, because the tools didn't let them communicate effectively with, um, with the auditors. Um, Blaming one uh, breach, you know, what's your Equ Equifax moment? Are you, you know, e is email a patch management strategy? Um, can you imagine just the feeling that it would be one person? So let's take some inspiration from other industries. I told you none of this is new. Some of these papers were uh, being written in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and, and some of the things I love the most are more into the 70s, but basically, let's look at the Forest Service. They have this beautiful guide online called the Learning Review. It's a Forest Service guide to the Learning Review. Um, and two things happen. They did this super cool sticky note exercises where, you know, what we knew, what surprised us, what, where didn't we have information that we needed, and you know, what, um, you know, basically, like, what are these learnings that came out of it? What are the, um, you know, what will we try differently next time? But the thing is, is they explicitly call out blame, and they say that if a person um, speaks up about a safety matter or a, or, or a practice or, or what have you, and it's ignored or, or, or what have you, they will quickly learn that speaking up far outweighs the benefits, um, you know, the cost is, is too, uh, too deep for them. So we always identify influences and we never seek to blame. Um, I heard many people talking about postmortems not being done if there's not action items. Do you have enough action items in there? Is 12? Like, is 12 please pieces of flair, like, action items enough? Um, and people talking about the learning, you know, what did we learn in, in that meeting? Now, and, and the, you can't move on until you've talked about the action items. But don't we sometimes um, create fixes and hot fixes uh, that have their own special way of and everything else up. It was a hot fix, but it like, you know, it made things worse. Um, your fixes and, and coming up with all those action items in the, in the co context of the review, there's no possible way it could be complete. You're still learning in that meeting, are you not? So how could your action items that were, you know, forced for you to have them, this culture of forcing to have them, you know, um, is that damaging? What can we do to be thinking about the impact of those? Because they might never help you, because the same incident like, never happens the same way. I know it looks the same, but anyways. Uh, carry on. Automating everything is, is not the solution. I know that automation solves many, many, many things, but understanding your automation, and here in this Google example, we see that the rollback attempt, um, there was another bad config change. And so basically you had automatic deployments, basically sending out this failure, um, and, and you know they're switching to manual mode when they're during a response. So it's interesting um, to think about automation in a, in a new way. Um, I am getting close on time, so I'm going to not uh, take too much more of your time. Economic failure and unacceptable workload are safety boundaries that are boundaries that happen in your service. Your service is floating somewhere in the middle of these like bumper guards on the side. You've got economic failure, like your service needs to be up enough that you can actually like make money selling it, right? Um, if it's down all the time, you're going to have economic failure. Um, we cannot work our people 100 hour weeks. Um, that is um, unsafe workload. And again, these two pressures force us and push us constantly toward this other error, this notion of the safety margin, where 
We think we have set up the best pipelines that are so safe, like we've got, we've got that cell. We know how it's all repeatable, it's beautiful. Um, so we set up these things, these defenses, right? But then aren't we fundamentally surprised in many cases when um, the system says, well, like, yeah, nice system you got there. Let me show you how it really works. Let me show you how it really breaks. Um, so when the error occurs, we do not know we've crossed it until the um, actually cross the accident boundary. Okay, so these, ac these concepts I'm talking to you are about finding those signals that help you build software safely. Um, I have to convince you um, that I believe, because I believe so deeply that this is important and I've seen it in other industries, they're hiring human factor specialists. If you're a building software and in any case impacts people, and maybe it doesn't now, but it will, SRE, chaos engineering and human factors, I believe operate and offer a lot of benefit at that safety margin. Um, those kinds of activities help you figure out where that thing is because you can't see it. You think you can see it and you can't see it. That thing will come up on you and like smack you with like errors that you've never seen and outages for, for failure modes that you never anticipated and your automation was never even designed to know about that kind of failure mode. Okay. I want to talk about the lived experience of incidents uh, through the lens of my seven-year-old in second grade. I walked in to pick him up from school and he was in tears. He was shut down emotionally and the teacher is saying, well, can't you tell me more about kindergarten? But his lived experience was, when I was at kindergarten, I was bored, so bored that I didn't like the school year. And she's, you know, it's his retrospective on the school year, so they're teaching them to think back. It's good. Um, but the teacher's like trying to get more out of me. He's like, lady, like this is my truth. This was my lived experience. I'm not going to tell you it was great. So the point here is that the people who are at the incidents and, and living the experience of the outage, the SREs, the directly responsible individuals, the DRIs, the on-calls, they are making decisions that make sense at the time, otherwise they wouldn't have done them. Because you come to work and every day, like that practice was safe, at least in your mind, right? And then something happens, you're like, oh wow, wow, we just discovered that, I don't know, there was, uh, you know, we dropped a table or something. Um, the point is, there was some point that it made sense for them, right? So you need to, um, I think, take away from this is that local rationality is about addressing our hindsight bias and our tendencies to view things through this perfectly linear, beautiful, time-stamped thing that, you know, happened. That is not the way incidents unfold. People in the firefighters, if, if you know about that, incidents don't unfold that way. They go 16 ways. You're leaning down and troubleshooting SQL, you're overlooking at the network team, and you're trying to keep the 37 executives from interrupting. <laughs> I'm serious, that's a thing. Start measuring. Maybe a metric you need is how many people were on that bridge. Okay, lots of psychological purposes for finding on, um, for moving on in the face of suffering. What do people do with the feelings of blame that we, we know that they have. Um, what happened? I want to find the cause, I want to find the root cause, and all of the effects. We need to not let this happen again. So we're trying to avoid reoccurrence. So these are the kinds of language that describe how people process that hurtful feeling of the incident. How do you explain deviance? You know, you shouldn't have done that. You know, you didn't follow the checklist. Um, but existentially, how do you explain suffering and how do you move on in the face of that? So um, a few closing points. Um, when you're postmortems, please be mindful of judging timelines without context. Because let me tell you, why did it take 
four hours to get that team on the line. They have a latency problem, and it's not going to work out. You know, we need to talk to those guys, um, to those folks. Were you on that bridge? Do you have any idea about the perception of time pressure that that DRI was under? No, but you're going to judge them and say, why did it take you guys so long to get the thing fixed? OK, you were on the bridge. You have no idea his, con the, his or her context. And by the way, when we are under pressure, these are not like lackadaisical events, right? We're under pressure. And the point is that, that when that time pressure is there and the pressure to fix, we have really skewed perceptions of time. And so when you're describing, why did it take you four hours? It shouldn't have taken you four hours. It should take 20 minutes. And why didn't you have an alert for that? You're damaging your team. Please stop doing that. But here's the key. What you're after, what you're after is, I want you to know that like, no one wanted it to take four hours, right? How about if you asked a new question? You've been told in this conference, ask new questions. What if you asked, what made it hard to get that team on the phone? We thought it was on the wiki about the escalation matrix, and we thought our pager duty alerts were like boom, 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 and we thought we had this beautiful like observability into our um, systems. So just a point. Um, what were you trying to achieve? Were there multiple goals at the same time? These questions come from Gary Klein. Um, and you'll find more examples of this in the Etsy debriefing facilitation guide, which is freely available. It's a 40-page PDF. Uh, totally worth it. Were there ever time pressure of what you could do? Did you ask for help? How did you know it was time to ask for help, that something was beyond the scope of the folks you had on the bridge? Um, what did you see? What were you focused on? And uh, what did you expect was going to happen? These are really like valid questions. They have to be asked in that, like, like I honor the lived experience that it took you four hours and like that sucked for you because you missed your anniversary. Um, this is from, you know, just a, you know, someone's meeting feels like this. Uh, there is no root cause. Every time you look for a root cause, I think you're missing so much of the equation. And um, the root cause is impermanence. Computers, you're all like, have these mental models and you're changing stuff and there's no way that everything can be real, um, a real understanding. And if you do um, really truly believe that a root cause is a thing and that that's a real thing, um, I would encourage you to investigate your um, feelings about failure and um, because they do not reflect a true technical understanding. Um, they rather reflect a social, social and cultural need to blame, to discharge those feelings. Uh, adaptive Capacity Labs and AllSpot, these guys seem to really, I, I learned so much from them. Um, they offer this beautiful timeline of an incident where you have the time scale across the top. You have systems relaying hypothesis, relaying data to you, like your monitors and your alerts. And then you have hypothesis. Was it a database schema change? So there's Joe going down that troubleshooting path. And in this fully featured view, we can overlay chat. We can overlay phone transcripts from the bridge. We can really create the picture of what that incident was like and really show, like, please tell me where's the root cause. It's not here. Um, stop trying to find it. It doesn't exist. And uh, by the way, stop measuring MTTR. That's also not a thing. Safety is a characteristic of their systems. It is not of their components. You cannot buy it. It is not a job title. It is not a role. It is everyone's lived experience of, of creating safety, and it's an emergent property. It's not something like that you can really see. It happens in an incident. It happens in your postmortems. It's um, 
really, really reflecting um, the, syst the systems thinking thing that we really need to get to. Uh, look, you've got issues with your postmortem culture. I hear you. I feel you. Um, but it's not some nebulous thing out there. The wisdom is in your team. And if you listen and hear people and like try to connect with their why and you know, why do why are they how did ask them how did you get into SRE like that's so cool ask your you know what do you do you're the culture I'm the culture every person in your org is a living walking hologram of your culture it's not out there and each of you shape it um, Satya Nadella is our CEO and I'm really privileged to feel blessed to you know, work under his leadership. Um, and he says in his book, um, if there was to be a renewal, it would take all of us, and it would take all parts of each of us. Um, and so that's why you are the right people here in this room. You are the right people to ask new questions. You are the right people to say, you know, I, I hear that you're frustrated with the timeline. I, it was really a tough incident. Um, can we maybe look at how it became difficult? I'm talking about making one language change. I'm talking about not trying to like sprinkle some safety on top and like now everybody's gonna like sing kumbaya and get it in incidents. Like this is hard work, it's politically unpopular and it's, um, you're talking about pe very vulnerable stuff. It's people's jobs, and they um, take that, that responsibility very seriously. Um, thank you all so much for being here and being here and, and taking responsibility and accountability for yourself to learn and to invest in yourself and to, to go to open spaces and create the meeting that matters to you and create the DevOps Days event that matters to you. So you deserve a huge round of applause as do all of the organizers and community and companies and sponsors and caterers and uh, you know people bringing out the coffee and just all of these parts of our systems that come together to create this possible they, they don't really like show up in your diagrams but they're all there and that's resilience those people if you stop counting how many times the service went down and you start trying to count well, what's the root cause of it being up that day you might start to just think about these different languages um, and ways of expressing um, I will not be able to pronounce this very well but I found this um, saying and it just touched me and I'll leave you this it's like may the calm be widespread may the ocean glisten as green stone and may the shimmer of light ever dance across your pathway um, and take that you know neighbor conversation to sustain you because the real cycle you're working on is a cycle called yourself um, when we work on systems and servers and motorcycles you know, that, that working well and that caring becomes a part of a process that helps us achieve that peace of mind. And uh, the motorcycle is primarily a mental phenomenon. Um, thank you.